like Dr. Trump Branch said, my topic for today is controversy is breastfeeding. It's basically a broad uh, topic, but um, this is how I have decided to approach it. I'll basically briefly talk about the background regarding breastfeeding, the benefits, uh, potential maternal costs as well, the controversy surrounding this topic. I'll briefly touch on prescribing uh, medication uh, to breastfeeding women, then I'll have a short conclusion. Okay, um, to start off, I just want to look at the rate of um, or the percentage of uh, babies under six months of age that are exclusively breastfed. Worldwide, only 43% of those babies are actually exclusively breastfed. Coming back home locally to South Africa, Namibia, where I'm from, uh, South Africa, we actually just exclusively breastfed less than 20% of our babies, and Namibia is slightly, probably 2% um, more than that. Okay, then um, a researcher by name Areola in 2002 decided to um, actually look at the factors or some of the reasons um, as to why some mother decide to breastfeed and why some mother decide not to breastfeed. And thus, um, factors are not in any particular order. But for the mother that decided to breastfeed, they said they did it for the benefit of the babies. They did it for their own benefit, uh, for their own ben physical benefits as well as for their uh, financial implication. It's a natural process, and they think it will strengthen the bond between themselves and their babies as well. That it, it is a very convenient uh, process. Those who did not breastfeed, they um, cited reasons such as opposition by the baby's father. They were concerned that their babies were not getting enough milk. They also um, needed to return to work. Or they either started breastfeeding and experienced some discomfort and stopped, or they didn't start a breastfeeding because of the fear of discomfort. And the, thus, some of the women that are really now concerned about the shape of their breasts, that it will actually be messed up after breastfeeding. Okay, for breastfeeding to take place successfully, the breasts need to go under dramatic changes in terms of size, shape, and function. And these changes take place in puberty, uh, pregnancy, as well as in lactation. The normal breast tissue of an adult woman is made of um, stroma, which consists of connective, uh, connective tissues uh, and fat that support the tubal alveolar parenchymas. And then you get four different types of lobules. You have type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 4. And in poverty, the formation of uh, type 1 lobules actually begins. And with changes um, in the levels of estrogen and progesterone during the menstrual cycle, the type 1 is then stimulated to develop into the alveolar um, buds and uh, involve to more mature structures such as type 1 and type 2. Uh, after completion of puberty, there's no further breast mat uh, maturation except in pregnancy, and that's where you get your uh, type 4 lobules. But, uh, to be more specific uh, in changes that op uh, um, occurs in pregnancy, uh, your first trimester of pregnancy is mainly focused with um, your uh, ductal formation, and then in your tra second trimester, you get more um, lobal formation. The third trimester is mainly just concerned with continuation and assimilation of the secretory, and secretory units and secretory activities to prepare for the um, lactation. The slides on the right there, sorry, my um, apology, I don't have a pointer. The slides on the right here are basically just illustrating uh, different stages of the breast. The top left there is just a breast, of, uh, breast tissue of a non-pregnant woman and the top right is the breast tissue of a pregnant woman and then uh, the bottom left is showing the breast tissue of a lactating mother and then um, the bottom right is actually the breast tissue of a mother that have stopped breastfeeding. After lactation, the breast actually undergoes a process called involution. And this process is very, very critical. Actually, I was hoping Shani was going to mention something about it. Um, it's actually a process that's brought about by the um, lactogenic hormone deprivation as well as the um, local signals that actually causes the tissue remodel, uh, breast tissue remodeling. And this process is actually where the uh, protective effect of uh, breastfeeding against uh, breast cancer comes from. Okay, over and over again, the uh, breastfed, uh, breastfeeding have actually been associated with uh, uh, benefits for both the mother and the babies. The benefit for the baby is that uh, breastfed baby have actually reduced risk of uh, childhood obesity. And there are two main reasons, actually. Um, the one is that the baby that are breastfed, they have a 
uh, a well-developed satiety center, which will actually help them later in adulthood to have self-regulation when it comes to their uh, food intake. And the second reason is that um, there's a lot of um, hormone called leptin in the uh, breast milk. And the uh, leptin does have influence on the adiposity, and that actually helps to um, actually um, prevent or reduce the risk of obesity. It's noted that breastfed babies have high IQ scores. They're more like, less likely to get sick because they have uh, improved gastrointestinal function and uh, a better host uh, defense system. And they also have a better smile because they're less likely to get uh, malocclusion. And because we know that breastfeeding is a very uh, caloric, uh, costly exercise, um, it will actually help the mother to lose weight easily after pregnancy. And over and over again, um, even Chanel have mentioned it, breastfeeding does have protective effect against breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and endometrial um, CA. And uh, just to say something uh, briefly regarding the breast um, cancer, it actually shown that even the patients that are actually um, kept, uh, BRCA mutation carriers. If they rest for a very long time, the chances of developing breast cancer is actually reduced. And this is more specifically with your BRCA1, but it cannot be said for uh, BRCA2 patients. Okay, the protective effect of breastfeeding in ovarian cancer is mainly with your ovar uh, epithelial ovarian uh, cancers. And it has also shown that um, breastfeeding does also actually improve uh, the survival rate of this uh, patient in case they have developed um, ovarian CA. Okay, they also noted to have reduced risk of metabolic syndrome, breastfeeding mother to rate um, stress much better compared to the uh, non-breastfeeding uh, non mothers. They also have low rate of postpartum depression because the baby gets sicker fewer um, or more, less likely to get sicker. They have uh, fewer medical bills to deal with and they are less absent from work. And we should not forget the uh, contraceptive effect of uh, breastfeeding. Okay, um, just like with anything else in life, there's always a downside to any to most of these things. Uh, breastfeeding also have potential costs, um, costs to the mother. Um, in terms of the physical cost, um, those mothers, especially the first 10 days when they initiate uh, breastfeeding, they might experience some discomfort. And we know very well this is basically due to either poor latching techniques or inappropriate position of the baby and can be easily solved by uh, thorough counseling and um, uh, professional uh, assistance. And uh, on another note is that um, breastfeeding, we know that it does lower the, um, um, the estrogen levels and that will actually then uh, lead to um, symptoms and signs of dry vagina and that might actually have impact on the sexual life of the women and their partners as well. In terms of labor and economic cost is that um, breastfeeding is a, a time um, it, it needs commitment. It's actually a process that needs time commitment. And uh, for that, for those reasons, we can actually look at this uh, ec labor and economic factor from the uh, women's side as an employees and the uh, employer. The employer actually, uh, if he or he didn't have, or his company didn't have provision for the, uh, such a space or uh, fridges or he does his that type of work does not allow a woman to take break to express her breastfeed. That's also um, actually a problem. And uh, for women herself, if, if she happened to work in an environment that does not support uh, breastfeeding, she's more likely to be perceived as a, a less competent or a, a person who is not taking her job seriously because she needs to take those regular breaks to go express her breastfeeding. That can actually um, um, then lead to a woman not being promoted or hired um, by the next company. But the other thing as well, it has to do with um, um, the, the, the provision that I had mentioned earlier. If the women, the provision are not in place, and this woman cannot breastfeed, she either forced to make it a, a two decision, either win her baby early or quit her job. With this, also have uh, financial implication and the, depriving the baby the benefit of uh, breastfeeding. In terms of socially, this is mainly um, to do with um, either breastfeeding in public or um, breastfeeding a child where the community or family member feel like the child is um, beyond the age of being breastfed and then they, these women face harassment and public shaming and therefore they decide then to just um, remain at home so that they avoid all this trouble of being um, 
shamed in public. And irrespective of whatever decision the women have made not to breastfeed, um, could be economical reason, medical reason, they actually have the fear that they will be perceived to be bad mothers just because they did not breastfeed, though they actually being very well on, or ad, in all other aspects of looking after their babies. Okay, uh, some people say breastfeed is Breastfeeding is part of our culture, it's a natural process, but it's one of those topics that's surrounded by a lot of controversies. There are a lot of controversies, but the one that I'll focus on today is um, winning age, the high IQ score associated with breastfeeding, HIV, uh, postpartum contraceptive, the use of perspires, uh, breast tosses, and uh, the last one would then be uh, breastfeeding in public. Um, in most traditional societies, the okay. In most sorry, in most traditional society, the average um, duration of breastfeeding is actually about two years and a half. And the WHO recommendation that we, women should exclusively breastfeed, breastfeed um, up to six months with continued breastfeeding with appropriate complementary food up to two years of age or beyond. But then this recommendation also um, seemed to be misinterpreted. Uh, there's part of the community that choose to uh, basically focus on six months of age and they define that as the winning age and then you got the certain part of community that decided to focus on the word beyond and that actually lead to a situation that you see in the picture there where you have um, school age going children being breastfed. Um, then that, that on its own actually bring up another controversy as to whether uh, are there actually any benefit um, in breastfeeding um, school, going, uh, school going age children or we actually doing more harm in terms of emotional psychological to these children. Some people have actually equated this kind of situation to child abuse. There are a number of studies that um, actually shown the, that there is a small neurodevelopmental um, advantages in baby that are breastfed to baby that are actually bottle fed. But however, it still remains uncertain whether those uh, advantages are clinically significant um, long-term benefit uh, between the two babies, the baby that are bottle fed and those that are um, formula fed. And the reason is that lots, such kind of studies are actually faced by a lot of confounding factors, um, such as the level of stimulation the child is exposed to, the genetic makeup, the socioeconomic factor, as well as the environmental factors. Um, the controversy regarding the postpartum uh, contraceptive is mainly uh, looking at the uh, use of progesterone-only contraceptives, and the issue is the timing of initiation of therapy because of the two concerns. One is that um, the progesterone-only contraceptive might actually interfere with the falling level of progesterone, which is actually stimulating the lactogenesis. And uh, the second uh, concern is that um, the, 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 because progesterone get to be secreted in the breast milk in a large amount, um, and given the immature metabolism of this neonate, will then lead, does not lead to accumulation of progesterone in neonates and it, 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 it metabolites. So then I decided to look at the two uh, bodies. One is the American College of Obstetrician and one is the WHO. They also seem not to be agreeing with one another. The uh, American College of Obstetrician and Gynecology saying uh, the progesterone-only contraceptive should be started two to three weeks postpartum, and uh, WHO is saying uh, the progesterone-only contraceptive are usually not recommended before six weeks of um, postpartum unless other more appropriate methods are not available or not acceptable. Then there was a a study um, done where some, uh, the researcher actually looked at whether the, the, uh, the progesterone-only contraceptive does influence the milk production, the frequency of uh, breastfeeding, and the duration, and uh, also in looking at the growth parameter of the baby uh, to see if there was any uh, difference. Um, with other women, with, with breastfeeding women that are using other form of um, uh, contraceptive, and he did not find a difference. But he did face a lot of criticism that, uh, in fact, that he did actually not take the uh, mother's concern into the account, and there was no um, long-term uh, uh, study that follow up the effect of this progesterone on the infant. So it still remains. Uh, 
controversial. The HIV, we know very well if a woman is HIV positive, um, uh, part adherent to their HIV, um, and they are, very, they are virologically suppressed, um, the risk of transmitting the HIV to their baby is only 1%. But recently, the National Conference um, and Exhibition of American Academy of Pedi Pediatrics, they were debating whether women living with HIV should actually breastfeed or not. Um, they, in their case, they're saying they have all the alternative to breast milk widely available. Why should their women take that one risk? Okay, but for us in our, reset, in our setting with our limited resources, I think it's quite clear we follow the WHO guideline because the benefit of breastfeeding actually outweighs that one risk. But for them, it still remains a debate. And um, what I made out of this um, study is that, that this um, topic is basically that the women should be properly consulted about the, the risk and the benefits of breastfeeding and the risk that are involved if they chose not to breastfeed, then they can make an informed decision. Uh, the ninth step of the uh, ten step to successful breastfeeding is basically stating that the breastfeeding baby should not be given pacifiers because um, it has been <coughs> implicated in early winnings and baby were weaned as early as uh, three months of age. And there were also several observational studies that actually um, supported the above statement. But however, uh, in 1997 and in 2001, there were two LCT done. They looked at the uh, rate of winning between the mother that used pacifiers and those who didn't use. They did not find any difference. So if a mother comes to you now and asks you, doctor, is it okay, can I use pacifiers? I think it still remains controversial, but there are also other risk factors that are associated with um, use of pacifiers, such as osteitis media, and currently they're also invest the pacifiers are being investigated um, as a contributing, a contributing factors to a sudden infant death. But uh, we, sh we still have to wait for the outcome of that study. <coughs> then thus breast tosses or drooping both breast, I don't know whether I should call it a misconception or whether this is really a controversy, but the bottom line is just to say that uh, breastfeeding is not a, a, a culprit here. There's a lot of risk factors such as smoking, just being pregnant on, on its own is already a risk factor. Whether you breastfed or not, your breast is going to droop anyway. Uh, gravity, body mass index, um, larger bra uh, size, cup size, and uh, either have a significant weight loss or um, Significant weight, uh, significant uh, weight loss, and uh, you age as well. So, but definitely not breastfeeding. Okay, we should um, show our patient in that um, matter. And then I decided to look at then um, what what are the laws saying now in terms of breastfeeding in South Africa? Uh, fortunately, we can breastfeed anywhere in South Africa. Um, and the, when it comes to work, the basic. Uh, conditions of employment act actually stipulate that employees are allowed to 30 minutes break each day to allow for breastfeeding or expressing and thus breaks are actually mandatory for the first six months of the child's life and then they realize oops um, we put all these nice laws they can breastfeed anywhere but these women are actually facing discrimination and harassment when they breastfeed in public then they are now busy uh, drafting a bill to a, a bill called breastfeeding and related matters to ensure that women are protected against this discrimination. Um, we have heard of the very good benefit. The evidence have proven it over and over that uh, breastfeeding is actually a very good thing to do. But um, breastfeeding in public is still such a controversial topic, and. Um, I tried to find out the reason as to why it's still such a controversial topic, but um, some people said we should uh, blame it on certain cultures or most of the cultures where uh, people choose actually to see the breast as a sex organ and completely forget the feeding function of the breast. And um, people are complaining that they're very embarrassed in public. Um, they are very embarrassed. They don't know what to do when they see a, breasting, a woman breastfeeding in front of them. And they say they're very disgusted by the thought of the bodily fluid that um, is seen during the process. Mother themselves has also been uh, blamed that they not covering up when they're breastfeeding. And the initiatives that actually promote breastfeeding seem to uh, be more focusing on the health system than the rest of um, the community. 
Okay, because of the uncertainty regarding the drug safety in public um, in breastfeeding, uh, most mothers actually uh, stop breastfeeding. It's actually for that reason I decided to um, touch on the prescribing in breastfeeding. Um, when we're prescribing in uh, medication to breastfeeding women, we should actually weigh the benefit and uh, um, risk, and we should consider the following <coughs> risks, uh, the following factors, such as the need for the medication, or if there's actually any other alternatives, the potential um, effects of the drug on the milk production, the amount of drug excreted in the human milk, the extent of oral absorption of, uh, by the breastfeeding infant, the potential adverse effect, as well as the age of the infant. But as you see, those are a lot of factors to actually want for one to remember and the whole lot of medication. So as I was preparing for the talk, I have come across those useful and user-friendly uh, resources. One is um, Lactment. Uh, WH also have some resources on breastfeeding. There's Mother to Baby, and I think this is part of the National Institute of Health, as well as the American Academy of uh, Pediatrics. These resources are actually regularly updated with evidence-based uh, information. We can also refer our patient to use such resources. Um, I think I'm almost done. So from, um, I just have a few points to say that uh, breastfeeding, um, a, a decision to breastfeed is actually a very complex one. It involves uh, social, psychological, and emotional factors. Uh, we shouldn't just tell the mother that the breastfeeding is the best, otherwise the they will breastfeed just to make us happy. We should individualize our counseling. Um, in terms of breastfeeding, and more interventions are actually needed from all the stakeholders. The national level have responsibility to, share, to ensure that they have registration and policies in place and make sure that they're also implemented to uh, promote breastfeeding. At the health system level, we are actually advised to adhere to the baby um, friendly hospital uh, initiatives and as well as have uh, ongoing continuous uh, professional development um, in our facilities so that we keep ourselves updated with evidence-based information. At the community level, structures such as um, support group, mother to mother support groups, um, um, home visit by a breast, uh, breastfeeding counselor can also actually um, help with the consents and promote breastfeeding. At any individual levels, we should actually advocate and communicate um, um, to our family, family members, friends, uh, colleagues about the um, advantages of uh, breastfeeding and give them the correct information. Um, yeah, and having said that, I think there was a certain individual in the state who decided she's going to advocate for breastfeeding. She then um, created an app called uh, Breastfeeding to Your Life. Basically, you just take a picture of yourself breastfeeding, you go into the app, and then you make such a beautiful pictures. But like with I said there are a lot of controversy regarding breastfeeding. Even this AMP was a um, controversy. So bottle feeding mom, they also went ahead and created their own AMP. So yeah, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alvi. Um, do we have any questions for Alvi? Alvi? <laughs> How, what do you think about okay, about how, about how, about how. Just wait. I don't know if it's the right um, word. The um, drugs that promote breastfeeding, like um, fenugreek, and um, there's some other off label antidepressant mm -hmm. that people sometimes prescribe. Surprise. Eglonite. <laughs> um, yeah, I can try and then you can. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kluter, for the question. Uh, what I have actually come across when I was preparing for the um, topic in terms of the, the, the uh, medication to um, assist or facilitate uh, breast, uh, milk production, the, most of the medications that were used are actually um, antipsychotics. And they actually, um, there was no evidence before um, to prove that they're safe or not. But recently, they actually say one that this medication have side effect on the neonates, is more especially the extra uh side effects, and as well as a neuro um, psycho neuro psycho neuro developmental uh, effects. So we should not use them at all. 
So they then looked at uh, the use of metacropomide and uh, domperidol, and um, they actually say um, the, 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 the metacropomide is actually much better and much actually if it, if it works much better and it's much safer compared to, uh, to domperidol. So, but they advise us against the use of antipsychotic as a mode of uh, stimulating milk production. Any other questions? Um, there was a very good paper by uh, Nina S uh, Stein, that's Prof Stein's um, daughter-in-law, on g galactogogics in the ONG Forum of February this year. Um, and uh, um, she wrote it together with Eric Leclou, who's the f from pharmacology. And unfortunately, the safety of the galactogogics that's used uh, generally is not proven. Even metoclopramide, it's not proven. And, and uh, according to um, the information they have, scientific information, it cannot be advised, which was quite a shock, shock to me. Uh, just the second comment um, is um, uh, healthy. I thought there was evidence out that pacifiers actually reduce um, stillbirths. Uh, um, have any of you got information on that. The, and the argument was uh, stillbirths probably are caused by suffocation and the, the pacifier can prevent that because it creates space for the baby to breathe. Not like what was believed before. So there is evidence that co-sleeping, the breastfeeding mother and co-sleeping reduces the risk of SIDS. Because evidence from before said that it's not safe to co-sleep with your baby, etc. But that actually decreases your risk and not increases your risk. Just a third, third comment, um, HRV and breastfeeding, um, the latest uh, information we have is that in sub-Saharan Africa, presently, with the use of ARVs, 50% of transmissions, 50% of PMTCT is through breastfeeding. So it's, it's, it's low. I mean, in South Africa, our official transmission rate is 2%, but that's until six weeks to eight weeks of age, but um, which, is, which is quite shocking, but it's still the p preferred method of feeding because uh, it, the many, many deaths are avoided due to gastroenteritis and pneumonia, etc. But I think our challenge is uh, 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 in the PMTCT field is actually now to address um, the risk of transmission through breastfeeding, and there's two ways, two methods that we, we presently conducting a trial in our hospital um, um, by using using um, monoclonal antibodies for the babies in, um, so they still get the traditional ARVs but we add on monoclonal antibodies and there's now the, the, the latest leg of the study we're using long acting monoclonal antibodies that you only have to get um, you can you can only get it once for six months if you continue beyond six months you have to get another dose and um, we also were planning a, a vaccine trial um, which the vaccine they used in Thai, Thailand that worked very well, but then it waned after three years. We thought to, to use that for the infants because you only want to protect for a period of breastfeeding for the HIV negative babies. Unfortunately, the manufacturer of the vaccine um, didn't approve that we use the vaccine because they were scared about using the vaccine on neonates. Uh, but uh, um, I think that's more or less the latest information regarding HIV, HIV and breastfeeding. Thank you, Prof. I think we'll call it a day. Have a lovely weekend, everyone.